Hello, dear foodie friends, and welcome to Kitchen Chat. I'm your host, Margaret McSweeney, and I'm so glad you're joining me here in the beautiful and award-winning Viking and Lock Cornu showroom at the Merchandise Mart. I'm here with one of my favorite friends and co-host, Chef Jamie Larita. I am here. <laughs> He's also the brand ambassador for Viking, and we are so thrilled about today's guest. I have been wanting to feature him on Kitchen Chat for a long time, someone who needs no introduction, Chef Abe Conlon, who is the executive chef and owner of Fat Rice, and congratulations on your James Beard Award this year. Thank you so and much. Welcome to Kitchen Chat. Well, I'm so stoked to be here. Thank you. Oh, well, this is just so exciting. We have so much to chat about. I know, Jamie, you have a lot of questions, too, but I'd love to kind of set the table here and, and just get a sense of when and how your culinary journey began, and you're still so young. And, and so not that young. You grown <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, my, my, my culinary journey started very young. Uh, mm. You know, I took a, I took an interest in cooking from my grand from my grandmothers. Um, I was encouraged early on. I, I uh, by my mother to cook at Boy Scouts, uh, and I would get into like cooking competitions in my Boy Scout troops. Wow. And then I uh, eventually went on to a high school that did academics one week, and then uh, the sh the shop the other week and my shop was uh, culinary so oh, wow. half of the week or for one week I would serve in the dining room or cook in the kitchen and then the other half I would go to my academic classes so math and history and geography etc so hey, what is your what is your background what is your background? So I'm, I'm Portuguese. Portuguese. Um, I grew up in Boston. Follow Portuguese. Follow um, Portuguese. I grew up north of Boston in yes. Lowell, Massachusetts, in a, a multicultural city, mainly 30% Southeast Asian population, uh, Cambodian, Laotian, Vietnamese, uh, but also we had Indian, Chinese, African, um, Brazilian, Portuguese. My family, uh, where my family is from, so. I was exposed to many different cultures uh, as 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 a young as a young child and then as a young cook and I always really kind of explored other cuisines other than my own um, and then just went on and, and and started cooking in the best kitchens that I could. It's only now today that I'm really exploring my Portuguese culture and global Portuguese food in general. Oh, and this is just so fascinating. You really tasted the palate of the world. At a young yes, age. Yes, very much so, yes. And so what do you remember as a child growing up in the multi-ethnic community of, of food? What would you eat? You know, I, I distinctly remember um, going to school and, you know, you'd have different uh, kids from uh, from all over in, in one class. And I remember the Thai, the Thai kids bringing me small, candied, almost um, fermented pork sausages with whole pieces of garlic and whole pieces of chili on top of it. It, was like, it looked like a candy and I'd be like, oh, what's that kid? It was bright pink from the nitrates or whatever in it. And they try to feed, they feed it to me and I, and I liked it. You know, I liked spicy. I liked, uh, you know, I liked those, those things. Or little small um, tin foil packets of shrimp paste that you would, that they would toast or the parents would toast for them and then they'd bring like a little bit of rice to school and then put the shrimp paste on top of it and I think you know that's one of my favorite ingredients now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah I was exposed oh. to that er er I, earlier I, I, I think most kids <laughs> yeah. don't have the same yeah, yeah. As, no. as Abe as a child and myself as well. I, I, I love all those crazy uh, flavors even with sweet and candy mixed together. Oh yeah, you know? no, it, I mean there's a whole world of flavor out there. There is, there is. It's to be explored. And, and sure. Do you have a, a culinary a degree? I do. And I do. I, I, I went to the Culinary Institute of America in so Hyde Park. Like, I graduated. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I graduated in 01. 01. Yeah. So I've been on my own for a while. I kind of bounced around. I opened uh, a restaurant in Dominican Republic uh, shortly thereafter. I graduated uh, with some friends of friends. Um, went to DC with a former chef of mine and some of my friends. We opened um, Hotel uh, Monaco in, in, in downtown DC. And then. Um, you know, my life, my life kind of uh, took its own path. I found myself in Fredericksburg, Virginia, in the boyhood home of George Washington. Um, they're running a 
fine dining restaurant uh, called Augustine's. Uh, we uh, received uh, four diamonds from uh, AAA, three stars from Mobile. This is before Michelin was wow. there. Uh, I was quite, I was quite young. I was 20, 24, 25. So um, just to dial back, sorry. Yeah, my sorry. Oh, right. this is why great. I asked him about mm. the degree. As somebody who's relatively young in the business, do you think that somebody actually needs a degree to be in the food world these days? You know, I think things that things are changing a lot. I, I and for me, I was very lucky. I had great, great training from my chefs before culinary school, and you know, because I did do that program in in high school as well. So I was already on my way. For me, I think that what culinary school did is reaffirmed the things that I already knew, kind of solidified, and and. Um, it gave substance to the to the kind of small introductory things that I was doing and the theory behind uh, cooking practices and everything. Um, but also then there's, there's the the business aspect and you know it, it's a broader spectrum. You know, but I really think it's like anything. It, culinary school is there if if you're going to put it into it. You're gonna put something into it. You're gonna get it. You're gonna get it back. I but have if, the same opinion. But if you but if you go if you go there, you know, <laughs> you know, there's some kids that go to culinary school because uh, it's their last chance before going to the military. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, I know uh, those kids. They, yeah. were at, they were at what was the name of that bar across the street? Oh my God. Augie's or something. Yeah, that was this true. But yeah, no, I really believe that that it has his life. You know, what you put into it is is what you're gonna get back. You know, and I, and I had amazing um, fellow students that were there uh, with me that went on that went on to do amazing things, and then you had people who didn't. And you know, I think that's kind of how it is. Now, are there any chefs who really took you under their wing, who mm -hmm. really inspired and had an impact mm -hmm. on your journey? Absolutely. You know, I think as as a chef that we're always learning from. Um, people that have come before us but I think it is important mentorship is is is, ma is massive in, in this industry um, for me I was very lucky I had uh, my first chef Ed Zoransky was also a, a CIA grad uh, he uh, and, and that was my first job when I was when I was 16 to uh, 18 and he taught me things like you know ba basic things but like how to make reduction sauces and how to make crab cakes and how to sear a steak properly you know um, and then once I learned everything I could there I moved on uh, to a restaurant called the Silks at the Stonehenge Inn in Tingsboro Massachusetts and um, my chef there was John Matheson John Matheson was an amazing uh, chef who came from New York he worked under Grey Coons at Les Pinas um, and so in er like late 90s 98 uh, I was cooking uh, incredible fine dining food with with Indian nuances and, and Malaysian nuances and fresh herbs and local ingredients and you know f very much the things that we're talking about today farm to table and and properly uh, raised animal practices and, and things like that so I was very very lucky early on uh, to work to work with John and he really took me under his wing and 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 taught me really pr progressive techniques classic classic techniques and um, and the people that he brought with him were also from uh, were also pretty internationally diverse I worked with great chefs from France and Switzerland and Hungary and Turkey all in all in this one place um, one other chef in particular, Frank Giovannini, he runs the Bacustior Swiss team now, oh. and he was John Souchef back then. I mean, this is we're talking 20, 20 years ago, but uh, you know, to this day, I've I've really you know, uh, I still admire those chefs and, and say, wow, like things have changed a lot since then, you know, yes. and, and there was a very that much apprenticeship mentality. Yes. I, I, I am, although you call me young, which I appreciate that, um, I feel that I'm one of the last of that kind of apprenticeship mentality yeah. um, because things kind of started to take a, have, have started to take a shift in the past 15 or so years as far as how people come up through the ranks and how long they stay at a place. How, you know, are these mentor chefs willing to take take you under your wing and give you the time that you need to help you progress and to grow? Is it still that way? Do you feel in Europe with the apprentice? To be honest with you, I'm not sure. I don't. I've, I've yeah, never necessarily wonder, cooked in Europe. I think it's more prevalent. I than feel like in Europe they have Margaret. Like when I went through that whole stage mm -hmm. uh, experience through Europe, I think in Europe it's it's kind of. Uh, part of the program there every day that they have 
you know, apprentice and stages in their kitchen. Mm. It's part of like the norm. Right. And that's just, you know, there are, there are, I still think that there are a, um, especially people that are in culinary school, um, the more education that, and the more information that other chefs, I always tell young chefs that if you don't travel, you're not going to grow. This is true. You know, so, and you're not going to be able to have that sort of esoteric palate that you need to um, allow your, 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 um, your, your palate to expand. The only way to really do that is to experience the culture hands-on and in, in um, there. I feel like in Europe, it's, it's more the norm to have those types of people working in the kitchen. And in America, that's changed a bit. Yeah, I mean, that's changed a lot for a lot of reasons. I mean, um, whether it's young people's mentality or even things like labor laws and stuff like that. You know, you can't really have people working for free anymore much I mean much like you can in 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 Europe where you have that stagiaire mentality where it's like okay you know you work here for free for a year or you were you know because you you don't know anything and actually the fact that you're here is costing me money right. Right. so you know but we we unfortunately can't do that uh, anymore that doesn't happen anymore in the states so I think that's a big factor so talking too. about talking about employees and restaurants sure let's get into fat rice a little bit let's let's, let's talk, talk about, about fat rice let's yeah. talk about how it happened <laughs> okay how the idea happened okay where the name came okay from, and, yeah. and do you now, after winning um, such a prestigious award, mm -hmm. how it feels to be that chef with that medal as opposed to what it felt like before? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, it, it, in regards to Fat Rice the, and, the, and, the, and the award and all, you know, I never really expected that uh, award, but I think um, it's great validation for myself and my par my business partner, my team, uh, for all the hard work that has gone oh, in. Your business? So my business partner, Adrian Lowe. Okay. So we started Fat Rice um, six years ago. We're going to be six years old in um, on the seventeenth oh, of November. Wow. So yeah, it's really really exciting. <laughs> um, so the way that Fat Rice started was before Fat Rice existed. Uh, Adrian and I actually ran a supper club out of my house for five years. Uh, I got a different apartment every year so I could seat more people. At the end of it, uh, I had a commercial space that was disguised as an antique store that sat 40 people. We served three to four dinners per week, seven to 14 courses, never repeating a dish. Much in that, you know, I was very inspired by Charlie Trotter early on, very much in, 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 in that vein where he was always progressing and always, always growing. The other chef, too, that, that really inspired me was, and also in the uh, Trotter lineage, is Norman Van Aken. Yes. So, yeah, I, I worked for Norman uh, in, in, my, in Miami early on, in the early 2000s. And, um, yeah, he was, he was, a, he was, it was amazing because it was kind of before he really uh, kind of expanded and blew up and at his flagship Norman's and he was there and really took me under his wing and, and worked a lot with me. So um, so when we were doing these, this supper club, X marks, X marks the spot, we would also do oh, it I in, we also do it in different <laughs> locations, right? We had this very like, you know, we I might do, that. we might do it in a barn in the sub, in, you know, up north or we, we would do it in, in a park or now in somebody's who, gallery. Who would be the guests? Anybody really? I think um, I heard about oh, yeah, this. Yeah, any, anybody this was really. This a talked about thing. Yeah, so it was a good way, and, and you know, a lot of um, restaurant tours and chefs had kind of got have in Chicago, in particular, have got their start in this way because it's it's a it's an inexpensive way to kind of cook your food, expose it to people, and have like a relatively, um, you know, you don't have a Yelp page where people are bl <laughs> putting you on blast, you know, but, but you know, for me, I really want to try to produce restaurant quality food in an alternative space. It didn't, it wasn't necessarily my home, you know, it wasn't my home. It could have, like we said, it could have been an art gallery. It could, it could have been uh, in a park or, or wherever. But the thing that after doing that for five years and doing over the 300 dinners with multiple courses and not repeating dishes, I had a multitude of dishes that I could use. And, and, and then when it came time, you know, after some cease and desist letters from the um, from, from the from the uh, condo associations in the city of Chicago. I said, okay, well maybe it's time to open a real restaurant. 
And um, that was difficult to pin, okay, what exactly do you want to do? What exactly style of food do you want to cook? Because we had this repertoire of dishes. I mean, we do Lebanese nights. We do, you know, because I dig up, what's Egyptian food? What is Egyptian food? Okay, so, and then okay, oh, explore that. So the, you know, large Middle Eastern community up there, go, go into those markets in the springtime, find the green almonds. Okay, what do you, and talk to the little ladies there or, or whoever's shopping. What do you do with the green almond? Okay, and then learn from them. And then really try to bring that back to the guests and say, this is what we learned, this is what, this is, then this is what we're making tonight. Um, so having that, having that repertoire of, of, of ingredients and, and knowledge, it was difficult to figure out what we were going to do. Um, Adrian and I, who's Chinese and spent a lot of time in India, uh, had an opportunity to go to China, went to Sichuan province, uh, learned how to cook uh, Sich authentic uh, Sichuan cuisine, and um, then went to Hong Kong. When I was in Hong Kong, I said, there is a place 45 minutes across across the river that is called Macau yes. and Macau I read about in 99 uh, again as a, as a young cook being exposed early on to uh, right because that's that's when Asian fusion was all the rage oh, yeah. wasabi in your mashed potatoes <laughs> uh, lemongrass in your velute and um, but those were chef made things those were chefs going to asia bringing them back incorporating those ingredients into their otherwise f french or western food and when i read this article actually by margaret sheridan uh who writes for the chicago tribune um in several magazine it was called original fusion and it was talking about these mixed blood portuguese chinese uh older women that were utilizing food as a method of heritage preservation that were it was it was a mixture of Portuguese, mm -hmm. Chinese, incorporating ingredients from India, Malaysia, Africa, and pretty much kind of the whole world everywhere, everywhere that the Portuguese had been prior. And I was like, this is fascinating. Um, it includes my culture and my culinary interest based on my, my upbringing. And uh, when we we're in Hong Kong, I said, we have to go at least check this out. Um, so ended up going to Macau for 36 hours. Adrian and I took the ferry over, kind of blasted around, as, ate as much stuff as we could. Of course, you have the things that Macau is famous for, pork chop sandwiches, which is a derivative of the Portuguese bifana, yes. uh, uh, pastel de nata, the, por the, 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 the Portuguese style egg tart. But I, through reading that article, knew that there was a whole world of food that wasn't found in restaurants and it wasn't found in the streets it was found in people's homes hmm. it's interesting wow. you say that i was in macau one time with on the madonna tour we went to um and we were in a casino mm -hmm. and i remember the buffet in the casino coming down for breakfast in the breakfast buffet i was blown away by half of the things i didn't even know sure but they really love their food Oh yeah, yeah, big we, time. It was really one of the best, most memorable buffets. I've ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was in one of the biggest casinos. Sure, and but the yeah. Casinos are oh. I mean, and they, they do a, they do an excellent job all across the board. And yeah. they, but you know, and for me, I I actually when when Adrian and I went to Macau, we actually mm -hmm. stumbled upon a woman, Donna Ida de Jesus. She's now I think 103 years old, <laughs> um, Macanese, mixed blood mm -hmm. Portuguese mm -hmm. Chinese. And she runs a cafeteria called Rikesha, which means rickshaw. It's a restaurant that functions as a community center for the small population of Macanese that are there and serves home-style dishes. Mm. Actually, she was one in the magazine article that I read about 10 years prior, 11 years prior. The universe is great. Yeah, and, you know, and I didn't actually realize until I got back. I, like, opened the magazine. I was like, oh, my God, I just met this you person. Met yeah, coming back, you know, when, when we were transitioning from the supper club to the restaurant, like, what do we want to do? I want to cook some Portuguese food. I want to cook some Southeast Asian food. Adrian's like, you should, we should cook some Chinese food. We should cook some Indian food. And um, kept looking and racking our brain. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I kept going back to the this book that Ida uh, had given us uh, that was a Macanese book and had all these unique dishes that, again, uh, I hadn't necessarily been exposed to, but I, but I knew of. And one dish kept coming across, a rose gordo, a rose gordo. And literal translation, fat rice. 
And um, it was a large pot, like a pie, saved for uh, family gatherings. It was, it was this big platter of rice with beef and chicken and pork and sausage and eggs and croutons and all these you know, textural elements. And I was like, yeah. yeah, no, you know, you, yeah, you're like, who doesn't want this yeah. thing? And especially in Chicago, right? It's cold in the winter time. Grace, Grace had just come out, yeah. and this is when Stephanie Izard started getting mm -hmm. popular with with her dishes and stuff like that. And and small plates were becoming a thing, uh, or really, really in vogue at the time. And and but the problem with small plates is there was one Brussels sprout on the plate that they said they were meant to share, but. They weren't really meant to share. It was really just for you to eat this. So we said, well, let's do big plates that are meant to share. That you don't have to worry about, oh, did you get your piece of Brussels sprout? Did you get your piece of bacon? Blah, 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 blah. It's just you can go in there and just do it. And, and a rose gordo really um, is kind of the spirit animal of what fat rice is now. It's this homestyle dish that's hearty, satisfying, and, in, and, and has elements from multiple cultures across the globe, all in one, and it's a natural—it's a natural thing. It's not created by a chef. It was created through family and tradition over time, and so um, a rose gordo and fat rice—that's our signature dish at the restaurant. And the thing about the name is, it really directly uh, informs what we're trying to do: Again, home style dishes, mm -hmm. multi, multi multi cultures all coming into one. Um, and then a symbol of abundance and generosity and hospitality um, that I think is really important. Lost sometimes in the world of chefs, in the world of restaurants, and you know, because um, really it's all about like bringing people into our homes and 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 making them feel comfortable and feeding them. And and well, that's definitely and, yes. when yeah. you go into fat rice. I remember the first time I went in. You get that feeling of, um, I was very taken by how your kitchen is set up and so open, and you can see that there's there's a lot of energy coming from the kitchen. Very much. You know? Yeah. And you could feel it, and as somebody that understands that and feels it, I remember my, my friends were actually telling me, I never told you this, that they were like, can you get your head out of the kitchen? Because I was so, I was just watching what was going on, mm -hmm. and I didn't even know you um, at the time. But I remember it was a fat rice just open, and the food was excellent. And but it was something about the energy in the mm -hmm. kitchen there. Mm -hmm. And I love how it all began with a home chef that yeah. you met in Macau. And mm -hmm. I love too. I can just, I just, I'm having flashbacks of Brazil and that whole feeling of saudade, mm -hmm. you know, missing oh, yeah. and craving mm -hmm. the homeland and and the aproveite, mm -hmm. you know, where you just really enjoy and gather mm -hmm. and experience that. But how did you get from Lowell, Massachusetts to Chicago? Why Chicago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what is that part of the Great journey? Question. That's a good question. Yes, um, so Chicago has always been an amazing uh, fine dining, you know, food destination, mm -hmm. period. Um, you know, I was inspired early on by, by, Char by Charlie Trotter. My, yes. my, my chefs when I was young were like, look at these books this is you know this this person is doing amazing things um rick tramato gail gand you know um you know rick bayless i mean these people that have been doing it for years here and then in the you know mid-aughts that's when you know when chicago really flipped and you had grant with 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 trio and then mm -hmm. and then alinea and and you had um, Omar with with, with Omar, uh, rest in peace Omar Kanto with with Moto and uh, Graham Elliott who was doing crazy things at the Peninsula at the time in Avenues, and um, it was just super progressive and it was really when when again I, I think fine dining and chefs was really taking taking a turn I mean you know I, I remember being in Fredericksburg Virginia looking at food arts magazines and you know opening and seeing kind of the crazy stuff that that grant and omar were doing and i was like wow like i ha i know so much but then seeing those things I was like i don't know anything you feel like you've achieved a certain level and then somebody comes along and they're like and you're like oh man like what am i what am i what have i been doing um so i was in fredericksburg virginia again it was great you know like you know i went the 
the owners there, they wanted the accolades, they wanted to, they had this beautiful space and they wanted the food to reflect the space. And, you know, we got our four diamonds and we got our three stars and, and all that. And then, um, but I was bored. I said, I got to go, you know, I have to go learn from some of these chefs that are doing really amazing things. And Chicago had always been a draw. I happened to have a, a childhood friend who uh, went to Columbia, to, to, uh, Columbia uh, for graphic design and was working. Actually, he works for Let Us, Enter Let Us Entertain You. And um, he said, you know, hey, I, I, I'm moving. I'm, I'm getting a, a bigger apartment. Why don't you come down to Chicago? And um, yeah, and just, you know, and I was like, okay. And I, I really, for the intention of, I mean, all the great chefs that are here, and I did my stages and things like that. But my, my main thing, I was like, I want to work with, the, the, I want to work with the Alini guys. I want to work with Grant. I feel like they're really pushing and doing amazing stuff. And this is in 07, right? So this is right after Ruth Reichel gave, you know, said, mm -hmm. number one restaurant in the country, with, uh, you know, Gourmet Magazine. And um, yeah, I just packed up my knives, packed up my uh, my little Subaru, and 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 drove out from Virginia. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and that was the main draw. But of course, life happens, yes. um, and 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 certain circumstances bring you to bring you to new new places. And um, I got to Chicago. I, with all the intentions of okay, I'm gonna get settled. Then I'm gonna like you know explore the city. I'm do little stages, and then I'm gonna go, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna go stage at Alinea and 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 get and see if I can get a job. And uh, and you know, this was actually, so I kind of spent a little, maybe maybe a little too much time exploring the city, two weeks or so, and ended up spending too much money and then becoming broke. And I was like, okay, I'm ready to go get a job now. And I called Linny and I said, oh, hey, I'd love to come in for a stage, blah, blah, blah. They're like, great, come back in two weeks because we're going on vacation because that's right when Grant got tongue cancer. Oh, yes. Right, yes. so that's so then they were going through all that and then they were taking a break. And I was like, two weeks. I was like, oh man. Like, and then two weeks after that, I'm not gonna get paid. So I was like, cause you know, even, it, I mean, chefs in this world, we work very hard. Unfortunately, we don't do, we, we, you know, at that level too, you don't, you don't really make any money. So um, that's, the, those things are changing. I'm working on progressing that and hopefully those things are changing. But um, I messed around for too, for too long and then circumstances uh, happened and, and uh, I said, I need a job now. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up walking into Whole Foods Market where um, my former boss, because before Virginia, I worked in the beer, wine, and cheese department in Georgetown. Um, I wanted to learn about cheese. I wanted to learn about beer, learn about wine. And my boss then, Tom, was now running this store in Wrigleyville, right there at the, where the Center on Halstead yep. is. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and it was like one block away from my house. I walked in. I said, is Tom here? I'd love to say hi, blah, blah, blah. I said, I was at the customer service desk. I was like, okay, give him the office code and send him up. I was like, office. Wow. Like, I got, a, like, I've already got <laughs> office You're clearance. Right. Okay. Yeah, office code. Yeah. I don't have a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Punch it in. Open the door. Hey, Tom, how you doing? He's like, oh, well, hey, I got a job for you. I was like, I didn't come here to work at a grocery store. I came here to work at a, a great restaurant. And he said, you get paid eighteen dollars an hour. You can make your own schedule. You can have health insurance, and and you get a, a Whole Foods discount card. I'm I was in. like one block of my house. I'm like I'm in, I'm right? In. right? So I, I did think the, about going to work at Whole Foods. Yeah, it's a great organization, yeah. you know. It's so, a great. Um, so that and that's really where I started to develop and be able to come up from the stove and be able to tell people what I was doing because I taught cooking classes, oh. but people at that time didn't really understand about cooking. They didn't make the connection of, I'm in a grocery store, I'm gonna to go to a cooking class. So I do demonstrations on the floor of like sampling things and like testing stuff out. This is how you cook a radish, or this is how you cook, a, or this is how you make an endive salad. It's stuff that people didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily familiar with. And then I said, I'm gonna start doing dinners, like actual dinners. Um, Thai theme, Lebanese theme, Indian theme, whatever that may be. And then um, the, one of the cool things that I did was doing these improv nights where I'd give everybody a glass of wine, have like, I'd have like 10 strangers <laughs> walking through the 
grocery store drinking wine, I say pick any ingredient that you want. Pick any ingredient that you want. Okay, boom, everybody gets to pick ingredient or two ingredients or whatever, and then I have to go upstairs and create something from all it was like a it was like a cooking competition, a TV show, like where I was the only one you know, I was the only contestant on there. And so I it was like doing improv dinners and improv dishes and um now that's before I, you did the dinners at my house so that, so, wow. so that was the precursor so basically so i had my own calendar and everything and i had my own like newsletter and sign up sheet for like people that wanted to be to hear about what i was doing yeah. and then after a time i said you know like i want to get back to my roots i want to get back to the things that i experienced in lowell massachusetts where i go to the vietnamese store and i'd pick out the weird uh, vegetable or, or the fruit in the tropical fruit in season or the fish sauce or whatever it may be that I was interested in and I was like I can't do that at Whole Foods because they don't have those ingredients so I said okay I'm gonna take the mailing list from Whole Foods I'm gonna make my own uh, website my own mailing list X marks was the supper club and then I put that on I said you like what I'm doing at Whole Foods come check out what I'm doing at my house and so then that so that was the transition and that's where and that's in fact where I met Adrian because she was running the um, she was running the catering department at Whole Foods and uh, she took an interest to what I did ended up helping me and in, in doing some stuff at Whole Foods and then we transitioned from Whole Foods to my house from house to yeah f over 500 dinners and then Fat then fat rice what so, a journey. Yeah, kind of kind of <laughs> wild, right? You know. I feel like you're going to be doing that again in a different way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think in a way I cuz you're you're like for me, uh, first of all I want to say yeah. is that it in Chicago? Mm -hmm. I mean, Chicago's the kind of place. First of all, I love the food, the chef community mm -hmm. in Chicago. Yeah, no, great Everyone community. Everyone is super supportive. Really? I see you and some of your chef friends mm -hmm. like Mindy Siegel mm -hmm. and um, people in Chicago, I think from a chef perspective, there's a there's this certain camaraderie. Absolutely. Yes. That is yep. a, a club, mm -hmm. you know, and they all understand each other's yep. pain. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> and pleasure. Yeah, definitely. And you know, and, and I think more so than other cities. Exactly. I mean, very much. I mean, I was I just spent three months in New York doing a pop up there, um, at the at the chefs at Chefs Club, mm -hmm. and uh, that was great. But you know, I think really coming back here, yeah, having this having the chefs community and for us to be able to freely bounce ideas off each other. What are our daily struggles? What you know? What, what what's going on? What ingredients are you using now? Where are you getting that ingredient from? You know, I think that's uh, it's 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 quite healthy. You Do you know? ever think about opening up another fat rice? Mm -hmm. I think about opening up m all kinds of fat rices. <laughs> well, the thing you know, the thing you should open one up. I'm gonna say right here. Mm -hmm. You need to open one up in Bucktown. You know, I mean, yeah. I, love, no I love I love Buck I love Bucktown no actually. I mean, I really do. Bucktown, um, Bucktown is. You know what I think Bucktown is starving for? Mm -hmm. Just a really good. And I don't know if this is fat rice, but I think Bucktown needs a. Um, a Chinese, a proper Chinese. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's the th that's the thing about there fat. There isn't one. That's a, wow, that's that a, is surprising. There isn't yeah. one. That's the thing about fat rice. It, it is evolving, although it it, it being uh, this unique blend of Portuguese and Chinese from Macau. Yes. Um, now I'm looking at where did this all come from, right? So I look at the Malaysian, the Portuguese, Malay, uh, Portuguese Malaysian community in Malacca, Malaysia. I look at the Eurasian community in, in Singapore, uh, Goa, India, even places like Mozambique, Angola, and Africa, and Capo Verde, and where my family is from, uh, São Miguel and Madeira, Portugal. So I'm taking a, a more of like a, a global perspective. On it, although we did start out with the cuisine of Macau that was kind of the end the, the, the end point for uh, the Portuguese travelers and traders and the, the and the mixed blood families that all kind of gravitated towards Macau but then it's like okay well where did this all come from and how did this start so now like when I was in New York and doing the pop-up there I definitely did more stuff um, from from my family's uh, heritage, did my grandfather's style of octopus cooked with like cinnamon and chili and red wine. Wow. Um, uh, you, you know, did did some different like African African dishes or Brazilian dishes, Malaysian uh, dishes. I even did some dishes from like Nagasaki, Japan, which was the uh, where the Portuguese landed 500 years ago, where they introduced things like castella, which is like a a, a pound cake or temp or tempura even. Yeah. 
Yes. Which comes from temperar or temperu, which is like a, a to fry, or tempura, which is like a, the time in which you don't eat meat around certain holidays. So I, it's taking a, a, a larger, I'm taking a, a larger look at it. So I could make multiple fat rices that have multiple different menus. Of, and, and that's kind of, the, that's kind of what the fat rice project is now. Uh, uh, still working with home chefs um, and heritage chefs that, that are, again, uh, utilizing food as a method of heritage preservation and that have these crazy unique combinations that I'm, as a chef, you know, you, you talk about being able to travel and, and having uh, that kind of um, global palette to expand yourself so you can differentiate, dif differentiate yourself from others. So, so I do think about it a lot and I do, li I do like Bucktown. You are still on a culinary journey, Big time. and I love Big this, time. and I love the ingredients you're introducing as well. I mean, on your menu, and I don't think a lot of people are aware of tamarind. Sure. Could you? Yeah. And I've, I've, yeah, yeah. I actually bought a tamarind. Those are those dried pods, yes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're supposed to be really mm -hmm. healthy and everything for you. But yeah. can you enlighten the viewers and listen listeners about tamarind? Sure. Yeah. And no. what you do with tamarind? Tamarind is tamarind is a, is an amazing ingredient, um, and we use a lot of it at Fat Rice. I mean, it's it's a fruit, okay. kind of similar. I don't know if you crossed a, a, a large fava bean that grows from a tree and a date mm -hmm. or something like that, right? Because it has this husk on the outside. Looks, it looks almost like a, like a large broad bean, but inside is this uh, sour, gooey, uh, brown paste uh, that has these nuts and these in this or oh, these seeds inside of it. I'll tell you the 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 raw pot is not an easy thing to work with. I mean, generally we get a small package of where the the the, the husk has been all peeled off and it's kind of compressed and then. Um, but what you do is you take it and you kind of mash it up in water, mm -hmm. and it creates this. Um, uh, this pulp, if you will, that is nice and zippy and sour and adds great acidity to uh, dishes. The most probably familiar dish that people would have it in that um, is, is a pad thai. So pad thai, tamarind, so uh, the, the sauce for pad thai is, is uh, traditionally tamarind, fish sauce, and sugar. So it has this balance of sweet and sour that really give uh, a great flavor to, um, to the, the otherwise kind of like in a way like flat flavor of the noodle or egg or pork that's in there you know that it really gives you the spike and the balance to the dish use it a lot in curries hmm. or in stews because and and for our in our world um vinegar and acidity was huge um f for to the portuguese because a lot of the food that i deal with is food that was made to pre it was it was preserved hmm. to be eaten later, right? So, and, and the things that were used for that were mainly vinegar, spices, salt, and 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 aromats like things that have my antimicrobial uh, as chilies and garlic. Um, so, but over time, right? As say say the Portuguese rounded rounded Africa got to India, they're out of, they're out of vinegar. So they need another acidic component to use, uh, and that, you know, they maybe they found that in in in, in India and um, and then incorporated that into some of their dishes. There's like a, a great dish from uh, Macau, and it has these lineages back back to other places. But it's called um, Puerco Balishang Tamarindu. So that means pork mm -hmm. with shrimp paste and tamarind. Um, so that's a, a stewed dish where you, you marinate the pork, you cook it, you add the tamarind. And this is a thing that um, if you have enough acidity and enough salt in it, you know, we've changed that over time because of refrigeration. But that's something that can be stored and last wow. kind so of indefinitely. You guys, you, know. are getting, you guys are getting, hopefully you're getting what I'm getting. Not only does he have like incredible amounts of energy and passion and is articulate in many yes. different ways. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. No, it's true, I gotta say that you um, kitchen chat thus far with the interviews that we've had here in our Viking Lock Renew show, and I wanna talk to you a little bit about our yes. brand look. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you're, you're definitely super passionate. Yeah. Do you ever see yourself, um, I mean, I see you doing 
some sort of a travel TV show. Well, you know, I have that, that radio face, so I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Probably, <laughs> you're, like, you're the radio face. You're like, you're like a rock and roll, yeah. kind of a rocker yeah. nerd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a rocker nerd. That's a good one, yeah. Uh -huh. I love a rocker yeah. nerd, by yeah. the yeah. way. Um, that you just, you're so passionate. I mean, from winning the James Beard Award, now people are looking at you and your brand and your mm -hmm. restaurant right now. Um, is there something, is there some secret little, like, desire that you want to do in the food world? Is yeah. there something that you want to talk about maybe well, in the future? Well, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't have any necessary specific plans, but now, and, and doing this travel and, and going to these places, and, you know, and I go to these very small communities that are equally as if not more passionate about what they do I say how do I how do I bring their food how do I bring their food to light how do I talk about you know I mean I'm sensing a little Bourdain like that. Right, yeah, 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 no, you know, I think it was, I'm sensing like a little bit of like a worldly, mm -hmm. I would watch you like doing Thank something, you. um, doing something on television. Have you ever done? Do you do a lot of television? Um, no, I don't do a lot of television. Um, I mean, I've done... Desire, I, I, I mean, I like, I like television. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I like television, I, and I like the platform that it has given chefs. That was also one of my inspirations, because, right, I, I mean, I think... Um, did Food Network just celebrate 20, 25 yeah. years or something like that, you know? And I remember when when that came out and seeing Emerald on TV going, Julia and yeah. Yan Can Cook and, you know, and Jacques Pepin and, and, and these amazing chefs were on TV and that was early inspiration. Then when, when Food Network started, it's like, wow, there's a whole other way of gaining information. And really that's what it is about chefs is yeah. gaining that information. And I, and I feel like now, it's, so, it's great that you're mentioning all these great chefs too, because back then, they were highlighting the chef, and those chefs became celebrities. And then right. those guys are on like this like panel of ten, and it's different now. The it's celebrity different. Celebrity chef yeah. uh, tag is different now. Yeah. I celebrity feel like, food. Yeah. Celebrity right. ingredients. Right. Uh, the James Beard Awards <laughs> yeah. has has, you know, in my opinion, if you don't have a James Beard Award, um, I, it's just my opinion. I think given the James Beard Awards to chefs that are so passionate about food, right? Those are now the things that people are looking at, like, mm -hmm. as far as different from then before. Yeah. I don't think celebrity chefs of that level are really interesting now. I think sure, it's I mean, the passion of your flavor and your food. Right. Exactly, you know, and, and I think like people, like, like like you're saying, Bourdain and uh, Andrew Zimmer and these people have introduced the world mm -hmm. to cuisines that they might not otherwise be exposed to or travel or culture and all these things. And I think n that's really what we, uh, as, as a society, are really interested in, right? You, you want to say, oh, I've been to Vietnam. I've sat on that little, the, I've sat on that little uh, plastic seat and eaten those, eaten uh -huh. those noodles that, 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 that Anthony talked about or, you know, um, but now for me, like, right, like I'm, I, I'm a nerd. I'm I'm into deep I'm into deep cuts, you know, and I start I started young, so like, you know, for for me for me to go, hey, there is, you know, there's a unique fusion of cuisine that is five hundred that is four hundred years old that lives in Sri Lanka. Wow. Like let's go there. Let's go, like well, let's let's and, and for the opportunity to be able to show that yeah, and yeah, to yeah. and to be it would would, would, would actually be yeah, incredible. He makes me wanna like he makes me wanna go there yeah. or at least mm -hmm. at least taste the food yeah. from there. That so could be your great, show. You're a great let's conduit. go there. <laughs> Let's go. I, I like it. Yeah, no. Conduit for flavor. Yeah. No, and I, and I, and, I, and, that, and that's what I feel too. Is like you know, people are like, oh, what is it like being a chef or this? You know, and I really feel, especially with the Fat Rice Project, is that I am more of a conduit. Mm -hmm. I really am, uh, you know, just trying to link the recipes that I learn to to my cooks than to my guests. Really, not trying to alter them too much. Really, utilizing traditional flavors, traditional techniques, uh, but also have to bring it into a restaurant setting as well. But yeah, so you know, the opportunity to do something like that, I'm not, I'm not opposed. Any to. books? Uh, well, we have. Um, I did write the Adventures of Fat Rice okay. uh, that uh, on, on Ten Speed. Mm -hmm. So that came out um, two years ago, mm -hmm. maybe three years ago at this point. Um, and where can we find that book? You can find that on Amazon. You can find right. that at any Barnes and Nobles. You can really find that anywhere. And that is the first like two and a half or so years of fat rice, uh, really focusing on um, 
Macanese food specifically, the savory courses in Macanese food and, and, and my interpretations of them within fat rice. Um, However, you know, they have classic dishes like my grandmother's uh, uh, Bacchia de Volvo, the salt cod spread that she made on Christmas uh, Christmas Eve, to Adrian's family's pot stickers, uh, to like a Capella meatloaf. And tell us the, the name of the book again. The Adventures of Fat Rice. Okay, the Adventures the of Fat, adventures That's of all fat all Rice. Yes. 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 Okay, I'll get that for you, Jay. <laughs> and we'll I have a link. No worries, <laughs> listeners. We'll have a whole link for this. I just want to take a step back yeah, yeah. to Brazil because that's okay, a yeah, let's go to part Brazil, of yeah. Portugal. And of course, feijoada, mm -hmm. you know, all of yeah, the yeah, black yeah. beans sure. and the pork and all of that. Is that just more of regional and where Brazil is, mm -hmm. or did that come from Portugal? So feijoada, also, so a lot of the things that were, that, 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 I mean, you definitely have unique dishes that have cropped up in Brazil. Especially, yes. so I, I traveled to Brazil um long time ago now 17 years ago and um, it was 30 plus years ago <laughs> um, in in places i went to sao paulo and to rio i went to but the one one place that i went to was was um, salvador bahia oh. which is you know you have yes. a lot of that you have a lot of african influence you have some indian influence you have you, you really have uh, a great melding of cultures there um, but something something like feijoada, mm -hmm. feijoada, right in, 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 in Brazil, they do with the black beans and the yes. dried beef and um, sausages and stuff like that. But say in north of Portugal, they might make they might make, make it with white beans. Oh. Or you can even have you can have feijoada de bacchio, which is uh, white beans with with salt cod. But feijoada are really derivative of, of feijão, right? Feijão, right. Yes. For, for, so for beans. So yes. it's a, di a dish made with beans. Um, uh, a large dish, usually a stew dish with beans. But in Macau, they actually put like these red beans and they put cabbage and there's pig ear and stuff like that. So yeah, so it's interesting. So the connection to like some days at, at, at Fat Rice, I'm like, okay, we're doing uh, Sao Paulo style feijoada. We're doing, uh, you know, in Macau style feijoada. So that, and that's kind of the, the interesting thing, right? These dishes have evolved based on availability of ingredients, whims of the cooks, what you know, and, and, and skill set of the cooks as well. And I have to say, my feijoada in, in Brazil did have a pig ear. Oh yeah, and oh yeah, for sure. And that was my first yeah, yeah, yeah. ear. So. You ate the pig ear, Margaret? Oh yeah. I, I took a little nibble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be committed to the pig ear. You heard it first. Wow. And I know you wanted to talk about the brand and everything. Yeah, I know. I know you have a. I know you have a relationship with our brand. Yeah. We are, um, you know, the family behind Middleby, mm -hmm. and I know you have you have um, equipment in your restaurant yes. that you use from the Middleby Corporation. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Pretty, it's pretty exciting to see the evolution since in our showroom the Middleby Corporation has purchased Viking and La Cornu, and you know that the quality has upped its game tremendously. Exactly. Well, you know, and and uh, f for me, like. You know, Middleby was always it always on the forefront of like, you know, having the highest quality uh, kitchen equipment for com commercial kitchen equipment. Right. You know, with 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 Jade and you know, which is an amazing brand which we have which we have in the restaurant now. But when they when they took over uh, Viking, I think really put put that emphasis on high quality. You know. Um, High quality, durability, and performance. And speaking of that, Jade, you know, the, the, they literally took the burners from the Jade and incorporated it and put it into the Seven Series. So you're actually yeah. getting those commercial exactly. Jade burners in the Viking Seven Series. So when chefs come in and they recognize that. Oh my God, these are parts actually from yeah. equipment that we have in our restaurants. So that yeah. was the great, um, the great connection and the great opportunity with with Middleby infusing all of their innovation and parts into all of their brands now, making Viking right now the uh, kind of the, the shining star within the company, using all their know-how and ingenuity and parts, making Viking not only a commercial looking product, but- But performing as well, you know, and it's important that, you know, there really should be no difference between a home chef and a restaurant chef. I mean, it's but you know, I mean, some 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 of the home chefs that I know, they're they're just as serious. They're in the, they're in the kitchen eight hours a day, so they, they need the performance out of out of out of their equipment, their ranges, their and, and their ovens. Yeah, and, that oven door right there. You know, for Yeah, us. exactly. Ovens, that's something you'd see. It's a pretty version of what you see in a commercial. Absolutely. Kitchen. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we know that you um, you have the parts and the, the equipment in your kitchen. Um, I am so happy you came in here today. It's Thank like you. I feel like I feel like 
I've been to Fat Rice before, but now I want to go again, <laughs> again because it's like the more you learn about him, the more you want to like taste his food. Thank you. And um, Margaret, I see you lit, you lit up like well, a Christmas tree talking I, about Brazil. I, I know. I have <laughs> so many fun memories, and you brought back the taste memories of Brazil, which was so special. But as the, our foodie friends know, the way I always love to end Kitchen Chat is getting your top three tips for the home oh chef. Oh, my goodness. Top three <laughs> tips for home. You know, I think, I think it, it, you know, uh, on, in the lines of there isn't really much difference between a home chef and, and, a, and a kitchen I, I, you know I mean buy high quality tools equipment mm -hmm. knives you know always always have a sharp always have a sharp knife always have uh, a good solid cutting board to cut to cut on um, and you know understand your space if you know if you know if you you need to have that's a new one room. I understand. Yeah, understand your space yeah. where are you uh, how, how do you how do you, That's your how do you I want to see I want to get a t-shirt that says <laughs> understand understand your space yeah. how do I get the onion from minutes. the cutting board to the pan you know yeah, safely without you know <laughs> do, do I cut over here do I cut over here etc you know I think um, lists are, are I, mean, you know, I mean keeping organized is so important especially if you if you you know it depends are you cooking for your family you're cooking for uh, your um, for a large group of people you know much like in the restaurant, you don't want to be, when the guests are there, you don't want to be scrambling around and running and sweating and dropping things all over the floor. You want to have nice lists, have your, have your, um, your ingredients parsed out so you're able to enjoy mm -hmm. the meal with your guests as well. I don't know if that right. was three. Yeah, but no, that, that was, was six. <laughs> but, that was but also, <laughs> that was six. Yeah. And they were six good ones. Our listeners are, you know, multi-dimensional. Dimensional. There's lots of different people listening. There are people that are parents of children that are wanting to get into the culinary yes. world, and there are actual people that are thinking about getting yes. into the culinary business. From a, I don't want to say a positive and a negative, but can you say something to that listener that um, about being in the business? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think you know, food is a beautiful thing. Few, food and, and eating and cooking, it's a, it's a method of, of self-expression that I think people, people are drawn to. Obviously, we, we as humans, we have to eat, you know, and, we, and, and, and most of us like to eat good, t good tasting food. Um, and creativity and all that is, is meant to be pursued. And I think with the parents of, of children that are in, into, into cooking, foster, allow your, your, your children to be able to explore, and then yes, and then fortify mm -hmm. by yes. giving them the tools that they need to grow mm -hmm. and experience. With all the while understanding that the restaurant business is one of the most difficult businesses that there is, and, and, and there's so many factors uh, that people are really unaware of when it comes to cooking because you have this idealist oh my god I make the best meatballs I make the best pizza I make the best whatever it is I want to share this with the public but if you don't have a business mind and you don't have the education and you don't have the training then you're ultimately going to fall flat so I think it's you know um, one thing I always do is I always say yes. I always say yes to opportunities. I always keep 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 open, and I'm always uh, trying to push myself to learn and to grow. Not about what, not necessarily about agreements, but about about business and about you know, uh, I mean, re really, really about everything involved in the restaurant. So I think it's important uh, that that people keep an open mind when it comes to uh, the, the people that are around them or themselves that are uh, interested in cooking and. And in the restaurant business, but yeah, it's it, it's 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 a, it's a tough one. Go get an education first, and then go, get good training. Then go to culinary school, or go work in the best restaurants that you possibly can, and and bring back that apprenticeship mentality that that, that we've lost over time. And I think really, and finding these these chefs and and these people that will take you under your wing and 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 really help you to get to where you want to be. Wow. <laughs> what a kitchen chat. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much. This Chef is my pleasure. Amy Conlon, and thank you as always, Chef Jamie Larita. I'm just sitting here. Oh, <laughs> thank you, dear foodie friends, for joining me on this culinary journey. I hope you'll go see Chef Abe Conlon at Fat Rice. I'll make sure I leave a link to the restaurant and to his book. And of course, come visit Chef Jamie Larita here in the Viking and La Cornue showroom at the Merchandise Mart. And I hope you'll visit me in my kitchen, kitchenchat.info and also visit Jamie at theviking life
www.thelaboratoryofdesignwork.com. That's another great resource, especially with recipes and everything. But thank you again, and always remember to take a moment and savor the day.